Good evening and welcome to our guests in the room. It's a cold night in Adelaide. Um, we're very grateful that you've come out and to the many hundreds of people who are joining us online. I'm Justine Kane, the Group CEO for Diabetes Australia and I'm absolutely privileged tonight to be co-hosting with Dr Norman Swan on our fourth debate in our great debate series for National Diabetes Week. Tonight we're discussing type 2 diabetes remission, hype, hope or happening. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet tonight and pay my respects to elders past and present. Diabetes Australia is committed to improving health outcomes for all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people affected by diabetes and those at risk. I'd like to warmly welcome our participants on the panel. So when I call your name, if you can just raise your hand so people online know who you are. So as I mentioned, Dr. Norman Swan down the front, he'll be the one standing up asking the hard questions shortly. Uh, Dr. Swan is a producer and presenter of Radio National's Health Report and a multi-award winning producer and broadcaster. We're very grateful to have you here with us tonight. Associate Professor Stephen Stranks, or Steve, endocrinologist and former president of the Australian Diabetes Society. Welcome, Steve. Dr. James Mukey, AM, ophthalmologist, founder of Sight for All and the 2020 Australian of the Year. Ray Kelly, a proud Gummeroy man who is currently completing his PhD looking at the reversal of type 2 diabetes in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Professor Jane Spate, Foundation Director for the Australian Centre for Behavioural Research into Diabetes, or ACBRD, as some of us know it, and a world leader on diabetes, mental and emotional health. Dr Lorraine Lawless-Smith, GP with extensive experience supporting people with low-carbohydrate ketogenic approach. And Bevan Bruce, who has achieved type 2 remission after adopting a life-changing keto eating approach. Type 2 remission is a relatively new concept for many and is widely defined as average glucose levels within a non-diabetes range sustained for at least three months without the need for glucose lowering medication. In Australia, this is an emerging area. It started in the UK and I might um, get debate around that, so there might be other um, um, thoughts on this, but it's largely started in the UK with two researchers, Mike Lean and Roy Taylor, beginning their direct study, the Diabetes Remission Clinical Trial, in about 2010. The trial has shown that significant waste, weight loss helps some people achieve type 2 remission. While we understand that remission may not be possible for everyone, it does indeed offer hope for many. And excitingly, there are a growing number of Australians who have achieved remission. We're looking forward to a respectful, intelligent and well-considered debate. We respect that there will be different views, but we know that this panel is very good at articulating very respectively the different positions, and that is what a healthy debate is about. So I'm going to throw to you first, Steve. Are you ready? I'd like to ask you, where do you think we're headed with type 2 diabetes remission in Australia? Well, I guess I'd say that we've always known that type 2 diabetes can go into remission, um, and there's been just a lot more emphasis on that as a specific entity and, uh, and establishing that, um, I guess, in, in recent times. And uh, I guess uh, diabetes, type 2 diabetes remission is possible with a variety of, of interventions. Um, standard traditional diabetes treatment produces remission in some people, uh, but more commonly more, uh, I guess, uh, aggressive methods of, uh, of weight loss in particular, um, various dietary approaches, bariatric surgery has, has made it very clear that diabetes remission is, a, is absolutely real. Um, but I guess the key message is that it's not a cure and people may normalise their glucose levels for a period of time, but they, their genes don't change 
and the milieu which caused diabetes in the first place will often still be there. So uh, I guess in the past, we used to call this a lot very well controlled type two diabetes and we didn't formally take people off their medication necessarily and determine that they were truly in remission by the current definition. Um, we've known you know, that they've been doing very well. Um, some people are very keen to be off all their medication and that some people will have uh, I guess uh, sort of life insurance reasons or driving reasons why establishment that they are in remission is important. Uh, but the, the message in terms of the management of that individual, even if they are in remission, are very much the same as would be the case if they were still di uh, diabetic by their glucose level. So in terms of complication screening, in terms of prevention of cardiovascular disease and minimisation of cancer risk, which are the big I guess, risks for somebody with type 2 diabetes, we know at the moment that we have to keep going with those, even people who are in formal remission. Now, eventually, there may be evidence to say that we don't have to be quite as intensive if people stay in remission, but I guess maintenance of, res of remission is really the key in how much benefit an individual person gets you know, going into remission for three months and then becoming diabetic again is probably not going to do much to their long-term health. So it's, it's really maintenance of long-term remission and how you do that are the key things. So we're very much more aware of the, of the concept. We've known it's been around, but I guess people are very interested in it. And so we're documenting it more than we used to in the past and discussing it with virtually every patient, I think. Okay, Richard, should the... Uh, sorry, I'm not... Gary, should the definition be... <coughs> is the definition too rigid, too lax? What's... Uh, well, I just introduced myself. I'm Gary Whitted. I'm an endocrinologist. I work in this building at Samri and for the University of Adelaide. Um, so uh, the definition of diabetes or the definition of remission? Remission. Well, you know, there, there's more recently there's been a cutoff of remission, which is based on glycated hemoglobin of less than 6.5. That cutoff um, may or may not be um, technically a remission because if you did glucose tolerance tests in many of those people, uh, they would still be abnormal. So I think the better notion is that you've got exceptionally well-controlled diabetes, uh, and whether it's actually in, in a state of no diabetes at all um, it is a debate. So I mean, the, um, point you, the point you're saying there is, which is important in terms of target, yeah. because what we're really all talking about here is a target, aiming for a target. And if you're saying that if, if your glycated hemoglobin is around 6.5 or, or under and not much below that, you could still have pathological processes going on in your body leading to poor cardiovascular outcomes. Right, almost, almost certainly. And uh, so the notion... So you could be sold a pup. Well, I don't think that's true because the lower the glycated hemoglobin and the safer you can do it, the better your outcome will ultimately be. So if you take diabetes is in fact... A so 6.5 is better than 7. Well, 6.5 is better than 7. You know, six, 6 is better than 6.5. It all depends on who and where you are in the circumstances in your age. But, you know, diabetes is a continuum because it starts with varying degrees of abnormal glucose metabolism. There's an arbitrary point at which we call it diabetes. Some people will define that by glycated hemoglobin, which will miss 75% of people with the disease. Um, and then, you know, certainly once the glycated hemoglobin is up, you've definitely got the disease. But if you define it as the glycated hemoglobin is less than 6.5 and at 6.2, you, you probably still have the disease to some extent. And so my view is that whether you induce this remission with weight loss, which is extremely effective, and there are a number of ways to get weight loss. Um, one of them is a very low calorie diet, bariatric surgery we've heard about, medication can cause weight loss and so on. There's always still that pathological process that needs to be managed. I, I want to come to Bevan and Ray, but before I do, Jane, I mean, the evidence is that if you've got a chronic disease, let's say you've got asthma and you're not wheezing, people start to believe they don't have asthma anymore. So the risk is that you, don't, you believe you don't have diabetes anymore, even though in the back of your head you know you do. Mm -hmm. So there's a behavioural issue there. So what's your question? Well, I'm asking you to confirm or deny that, really. <laughs> Would you like to confirm or deny? Um, I do believe that people will believe that they don't have diabetes anymore, and that's largely because of what they're being told. 
that they no longer have diabetes. Um, and it's a problem because, as our medical colleagues here will say, people need to have uh, checks along the way. Um, we need to keep monitoring uh, for uh, potential complications or uh, their glucose levels going up again. Um, and they do need to be, I think the key thing about- Just before you go on, before you do the key thing, could you put your microphone on the other lapel and higher? Because your face is coming out, it's just for not getting all your- That would be great. Thanks. Is that better? I should put it on the inside of the lapel, just there. Oh, sorry, it's just very sensitive to. That would be an awful lot better. Great. Okay. Um, the key thing, uh, and I agree with what Gary was saying, I don't use the word controlled when I refer to diabetes, I call it well managed diabetes, but I do think that what we're talking about here is very well managed diabetes, whether that's with medications, whether it's with dietary intervention, physical activity glucose excursion monitoring, any of these things can help someone to manage their diabetes really well and achieve an HbA1c around 6.5%. But it's really tough to do that and it's really tough to keep that going in the longer term. And I do think that we should be taking into account that effort on that part of that person. When we say that someone's in remission, when we say that in cancer, it's usually because they've had chemotherapy and they've gone away and now they don't need to do anything else. They can get on with their life and just keep coming back every few years to see whether, sadly, it might have come back or not. But with diabetes, it's not the same thing. They're actually having to work very hard to keep it in remission. So I just want to get a, a kind of factual basis here before we go on with this debate. Steve, is, it, is this like blood pressure? So if you've got normal blood pressure, it doesn't matter whether you're on blood pressure medications or not. Normal blood pressure means your risk of dementia, coronary heart disease, stroke drops. And life insurance companies recognize that. It doesn't matter whether you're on medication or not. Does it matter whether or not, you, I mean, it may be inconvenient, you may have side effects, I understand that. But does it matter if you've got your HbA1c down to below 6.5, whether you're on medication or not? Yeah, I mean, that is a bit complicated because there are specific therapies which have specific effects on particular outcomes. And so the way that type 2 diabetes is treated now is dependent on what the comorbidities or the other illnesses of the person is. So, uh, but in a broad sense, that's true. So if you achieve an HbA1c of 6.5% purely with dietary measures, or if you achieve it with metformin, or you achieve it with insulin, but not with any hypoglycemia or, or other um, or other side effects, then the in terms of the outcomes in terms of microvascular, uh, eye, kidney, nerve problems are very much the same. Uh, quality of life is deemed by most to, in most studies to be very similar, uh, reflecting the glucose control rather than the number of medications that people take. Now there are individuals who for whom they don't like taking medications, they would prefer not to. But in terms of hard outcomes, yes, HbA1c, lipids, blood pressure are, are very much uh, the best indicators of, of what sort of well, outcomes people We'll come back have. to the comorbidities such as heart disease, etc. in a moment. Bevan, tell, me your, tell us your story, because it's quite remarkable. Is it? Well, I think so. <laughs> I'm impressed. No, I can tell you, I, would, I walked into James Mookie's um, surgery and had eye injections to keep me uh, uh, seeing my sight. I actually had lost a bit of sight, quite a bit. Uh, From diabetic eye disease? Yes, yes. And uh, he tapped me on the shoulder one day and said to me, I think I know something that you could do. And he put me onto the keto diet through Michelle Martin, a dietitian. Uh, that's a story. But the issue is he did give me that care that I needed. I read some books on an Easter weekend and decided to do it. Um, I have to say it's not that hard if you're determined because I love my wife, I love my kids, and I love my grandkids. They're the most important things within my... More than you love pasta. Yeah, and then my friends come next and business comes next. I had thought about retiring at the age of about 66. I'm 71 now and I still do 15 items a weekend. And the only reason I can do it is I've got off of all the juice. Because when I had the juice, I was just a lazy fellow that sat in the chair and watched TV because it fell that way. So I just got very determined about the whole thing. And the more the determined I got, the more people I end up speaking to. But I know everyone doesn't want to do it. And that's what interests me. They're all, oh, I've got a mate who's going to lose some toes. He didn't drink about it. He heard my story. But what it really gets back to is you need somebody who keeps you 
on tabs. And I'll tell you what happened to me. My wife got bowel cancer. So she went on a keto diet for bowel cancer. She walked in and got the bottle every week for the chemo. She walked out and went straight to her office and worked. Other people walked out in a wheelchair or a walker. She felt she got more energy. Yeah. yeah. And this is what this diet plan did. It was amazing for us. I thank James. I, he knows I thank him. But it's really been my lifesaver and for my whole family. We've just gained another life. So is the whole family a keto diet? No, no, just my wife and I. Right. Yeah. My kids will get on if they need to. <laughs> and just give me a sense. I mean, I, 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 at times, I've got a problem with my weight. So, so at times I've gone on, on, a, on a keto diet. And, you know, after you've got over the first two or three days, you actually do feel quite good. You get that energy burst and so on. But I, I find it, in this modern world, I find it very hard to maintain, you know, one glass of wine and you've turned it off, for example. You know, so it's very hard to, I find it very hard to maintain. Have you, you've got to do I, moderation. Look, I do have a glass of wine, but I only do it on a Saturday or a Friday night if we go out. I don't drink at home. The other side to it is I'm under berries and I'm stick with them. I'm very, very, very. I have berry, four berries in the mornings and then I go and have a black coffee at a coffee shop every morning. Then I don't have anything until about two o'clock and I have berries again. And right. People might say that's wrong. So a people here might say I'm doing the wrong thing, but I've been on this for four years, and I, a, I fell off the perch a very short period. I was overseas, actually, and I quickly got it right within a few days because I didn't do the right thing. And how quickly did your diabetic measures go back to Pretty quick, I, within a few days, and I knew it. I and you're still measuring it. them now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my measuring. issue is now I'm fine. I've been I, – that's, that's a year ago. So since then, I've been fine. But I've actually gone to people who've helped me. Yes, I, would, I will say this. I can afford to go to people who can help me. I feel sorry for people who can't. That's where the whole so dilemma in me is it's about a, money. It's a, it's a team sport. You can't it's, be expected yeah. to do it by yourself. No, you can't. No. And there's not enough support for people. So, Ray, is this a, a middle class, you know, well-off suburb aspiration here? I mean, we've had very... Um, little discussion, we, we try to have discussion, but very little discussion really about the community who has the most type 2 diabetes in Australia, which is the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander communities. Is this just a fantasy conversation or is, is this something that could be real for First Nations people? No, it's certainly real and, and mainstream health. We've all, also run programs ourselves in Western Sydney, so places place where there is um, you know, a, a big challenge around chronic disease. Uh, with, with great success, but yeah, look, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people do really well in this area. Uh, we've uh, yeah, we we go into communities and work with the communities, co-design, train the local doctors and nurses, and they they run these programs within the primary care setting, and it, it's really important. And like Jane said, for some people it's going to be really difficult to sustain, and for some people it's it's not going to be as difficult. But it's about building that culture around community. So how, what, well, tell me how you engineer this, because in Aboriginal communities, notoriously, the sort of food that you want to buy to have a low-carb diet is A, it's more expensive than average, and B, the shop sometimes doesn't have it. Yeah. And so it's access, even if you want to do it, is hard. 100%. And that's why we just work with what we can work with. So we have uh, some communities where they might have a couple of stores. If we have that luxury, two different stores, so they play off each other for price, so the pricing isn't so bad. And to be honest, uh, we, we do a bit of a, a measure on cost of food uh, where we go, and we found that the supermarket, a big, big name supermarket in Western Sydney, uh, it costs the same to buy fresh food there as what it did in Burke, uh, in yeah, uh, regional, remote New South Wales. But in other communities, we've got one store and no fridges. So you can't refrigerate your food, you're not, you're not uh, cooking in bulk and preparing, you're buying from the shop every day. So there's this real food and water inequity that's uh, causing a lot of problems. We, we had one place where they run out of water, uh, where every bottle of water had to be shipped in, and this is a, a big community, uh, and then uh, the local supermarket burnt down as well. So it's tough to run out. So it's easier to get there. sugar, sweet and soft drink. Much cheaper. So where does, it, and you're an exercise physiologist, where does exercise fit into this remission story? Well, we work with across every area. So like diet, nutrition, motivation. But exercise, I guess people misunderstand where exercise fits in a lot of the times because they're thinking about the calorie burn, which is disappointing if you think about uh, exercise in that respect. But Exercise plays metabolically plays a much bigger role. 
but also uh, for uh, mental health, for motivation, uh, for support around each other, like especially for the Aboriginal community, we like getting together and uh, yeah, playing sport or yeah, going for a walk or something. So look, it, it, play, it plays a very big role. And for, for the, our communities, we often just get people started by walking 20, 30 minutes a day. So I remember Karen O'Day at Deakin University did her famous study where she took people back into the bush to live a bush lifestyle and their type two diabetes you know, their HbA1c's went back, well, it was actually fasting blood sugars, I think, went back pretty much to normal within a period of a month or something like that. Seven weeks, yeah. Um, but, you know, that's not necessarily sustainable. So how sustainable is the intervention? Which is really yeah. the same question I asked Bevan. Yeah, well, well look, if you, if you look at our pro program in Canambles, it's a population of 2,700 people run out of the Aboriginal Medical Service. Over two years, like, you know, we've we got to go with what measures we can get. So that's body weight is, is a good standard measure we can look at. They've lost something like 22, 2300 kilos across the population over the last two years. And we did an assessment after 15 months and the average weight loss that was sustained over that was 8.6%, which is phenomenal. If you were doing that in the cities, that would be considered phenomenal. So look, it's going to be different in every community because each community has different strengths and barriers, but we only need three or 4% to make a substantial change. James, we did a session on access the other day in terms of you know, the annual check. I mean, the statistics are that 50% of people don't have their HbA1c done on an annual basis. 73% of people don't have their renal function done on an annual basis, um, and, and so on for the other uh, metabolic measures in terms of lipids and other risk factors. So their annual cycle of care is not being done for anywhere between 30% and 70% of people. Um, how motivated can we make people, if they're not actually doing their annual cycle of care, and I'll come to Lorraine on this because this is obviously a general practice issue, how can we then motivate them to do what can be actually quite hard work, which is to change their diet, change their exercise, to achieve the sort of things that you've been advocating for now for some years? I think one of the important things is uh, continuous glucose monitoring. Uh, it's recently uh, been uh, approved and funded for patients, people with type 1 diabetes. Uh, it's not available yet for patients, people with type 2 diabetes, and it should be because what happens when people have access to CGM, continuous glucose monitoring, is that they can see the impact of various foods on their blood sugar level. And when they can see the impact of those foods on their sugar level, uh, they're able to take back control of their, of their condition. And that is empowering and that allows them to... So it's uh, like biofeedback in a sense. Exactly, exactly. In fact, uh, there's a trial in, w in Western Sydney doing just that, giving people continuous glucose monitors. Well, we've got one going nationally too, the FLASH trials. Can you imagine if everyone in the country with mm -hmm. type 2 diabetes had access to a CGM, could see what foods were impacting their blood sugar level, and then we're able to do something about it. It really is empowering, and it allows them, as I say, to take back control, and then hopefully potentially avoid those devastating complications that potentially await. So have there been good studies in ophthalmology about you know, halting the microvascular disease in retinopathy and reversal? Do we, do we know for sure what happens? No, no. and and. Just going back to Bevan's uh, story, which is extraordinary. Bevan first started giving injections into his eyes back in 2015, and he was having regular injections. I have some patients with type, let's just talk about type 2 diabetes, because that's what we hear about tonight, um, who are having four weekly injections into their eye, and it's a special antibody that seals up the <coughs> leaky blood vessels within the eyes and allows the, uh, the swelling at the central vision area to, uh, to uh, stabilize and hopefully even improve. So some patients are on four weekly, six weekly, eight weekly, 10 weekly. We were eventually able to get Bevan out to 12 weekly, 12 weekly injections, so four times a year in each eye. And then in, I think it was probably 2021, when I said to Bevan, you're aware that you could put your type two into remission. He wasn't aware, and as he mentioned, we sent him to a nutritionist, Rochelle Martin, and then very quickly, Bevan, and it was extraordinary because he was coming back, and you know he'd come back one, one uh, uh, treatment session, and he'd come off his insulin, and then come back the next treatment session, and he'd come off all his medicines, and he came back you know, the subsequent one, and said, I've never felt better, and I'm starting to see better. It, it was, for me, I think Bevan was probably the first of my patients, 
it was such a, a profound and exciting experience to be a part of that, to see that remission happening. But if we actually look at the eye, if we look at the eye and we look at uh, macular edema, so the macula is the central vision area of the retina in the eye uh, and edema is swelling. And so this is the leading cause of loss of vision in people with uh, type 2 diabetes. Now, what, we no what I've noticed, and I have now have over 50 patients that have uh, – entertain some form of therapeutic carbohydrate reduction, quite a number who've gone into remission. And in virtually all of those, we're seeing a reduction in the macular edema. Some who are not on regular injections and many who are. And the patients who are on regular injections, almost all of them were able to then extend the frequency of the injections out. So Bevan went from 12 weekly injections, which he was having for several years, and he's now out, I think, to six monthly injections, and I'm hoping that in the coming uh, months we'll actually be able to stop. So it's, it's remission in action. Uh, there is no data, there's no studies about it. I'm actually doing a number of studies at the moment. So I'm hoping to, to get those out there before too long because it's, it's, we had this great good fortune as ophthalmologists to be able to look into the eye and see the blood vessels. We can see the damage being done and we can also see the damage being reversed. So it's, it's a wonderful thing. So Rene, you're at the front line. Um, we discussed this the other night uh, that we're not gonna solve the problem of type two diabetes with all due respect to the endocrinologists and ophthalmologists on our panel, um, that there are not enough of them to go around and they're not in the right place. It's only going to be through primary care. Now, you're intervening here with therapeutic diets. Just tell me your approach here. I just, I just want to back up a little bit and say, um, over, I've been in general practice for 37 years. It's a long time. And over that time, I've dealt with a, a lot of people who've had type 2 diabetes and many more who've had prediabetes and consequences of prediabetes like fatty liver. And essentially for all of them, the, um, their future has looked like a chronic progressive disease, which is going to get worse and worse. And they're going to get on more and more medication and they'll eventually end up on insulin. And if they live long enough, they're going to have the complications of diabetes. Um, and that's the story we told them. Um, and that's what I believed and that was my experience. Um, so, I adopted a low carbohydrate diet for my personal reasons. So I was obese, pre-diabetic, I had fatty liver, I had sleep apnea. Um, and I was following the guidelines, I was eating less and exercising more, I had a, a low fat diet and I was just getting fatter and sicker. And like many, many of my patients, I felt deeply ashamed of where I was because I should be able to do better, I was a doctor. And this is this whole stigma around this. Yep. everything that we're talking about, which we haven't talked about yet, yep. is about stigma. And we'll come to that with Jane in a moment. And the reason I'm talking about this is because I think that so many of my patients were completely disempowered. So they felt that they're on this train and they couldn't get off and things are just going to get worse and worse. And it didn't matter what they did, they were going to be on more medication and they were going to get complications. And I think one of the pe reasons people don't show up for follow-up is because they feel disempowered um, and they feel like there's no hope. And so... So this is what you argue sits behind those statistics that I just... I mean, you know, that we could get into conversations about how, you know, general practice is, is really suffering badly in this country and, you know, the whole thing that the way to make medicine in general practice is five-minute medicine, pushing people in and out, and that really is not good for chronic complex diseases. But I think part of the story is about patients feeling like there's no hope. Um, and so what I see as a low-carbohydrate approach is that um, all of a sudden we are giving, sharing with patients a tool that they can use which decreases their hunger, decreases their cravings, and, and gives them a tool that they um, can see um, improves their blood sugar control, improves their blood pressure, um, and they can see a future and they have hope. And that was my experience, that I had hope. So I've probably not answered your question, Norman, but um, I, th I think the, the, the real answer is that the way we're treating diabetes is wrong, that we're using the Australian Dietary Guidelines, which are designed for healthy people, the diabetics, and you know, high carbohydrate, low fat diet, um, in my experience and in scientific literature, is not a good good fit for people with type two diabetes. They do better on low carbohydrate, or maybe even type one. So, do you do it with a dietitian, or do you do it by yourself? How do you do it? No, I work with. I have a, a dietitian who just does low carbohydrate and ketogenic nutrition, and I also have a health coach. Um, and the the reason for the health coach is a lot of a lot of the, the 
a lot of the hurdles are around mindset um, and dealing with people's um, shame, their body image, uh, comfort eating, um, you know, food addiction. And so having a health coach is really a very useful addition. So I know we're dealing in, in, in anecdote, but so of 100 patients that you would put on a low-carb kind of keto diet, a year later, how many are still on it? Uh, probably 50%, to be honest. Um, and I'm disappointed in those sort of figures. If you look at there's a, there's a general practice in the UK, the Norwood Surgery, which is run by um, a GP called David Unwin, He's been doing low-carbohydrate diets for eight years, um, and he, he sits at 50% remission at eight years. Um, so he does really well, and he does really well on 10-minute consults and then group classes. So I, I'm sort of fascinated about what I'm doing wrong that I'm not getting the figures that he's getting. Um, but I do get people who, who do achieve diabetes remission. Maybe you're just a bit more transparent. <laughs> Maybe I am. But Very careful yeah, what I said About here. 50%. It's not for everybody. It's... Um, there are problems around our food environment. Um, there are problems. Of yeah, no, I, I understand that. No, but so 50% are still on it at 12, um, months. at 12 months. So they're feeling better, their, their appetite's gone down, probably got a bit more energy if you follow the literature on a ketogenic diet. Um, what percentage of those are off the medications and fit the definition of remission? Um, I, I don't have actual figures, but, you know, maybe 40%. 40% of the 50%? 40% uh, uh, in total. Right. So, I mean, the, one of the problems with the definition of remission too is that you know, there is some evidence, re remission means off all medication, and there is some evidence that these patients should probably stay on metformin because it does make them more insulin sensitive. Um, and to fit the definition of remission, you have to take them off metformin. Yeah. So it's a bit counterproductive. So in terms of... You know, is it actually the definition of remission? They are on. They've got a hemoglobin A1C of less than six point five, and they're on metformin. So, Jane, what are the behavioural challenges here? So, I think we're talking again about well-managed diabetes, not remission. Um, the behavioural challenges, I think, for the individuals, um, are around uh, the issue that this is quite a radical change in dietary behaviours. Um, not everyone has access to the healthy foods that we're talking about. Not everyone can um, cook those healthy foods and knows how to do that and has those skills to do that. Um, not everyone can do that within the family context that they have. And there's family uh, and cultural and social issues around trying to stick with this type of eating plan. And I'm not saying that it's uh, a terrible eating plan. I'm saying I, I appreciate that it's a pretty healthy eating plan. I'm just saying it's pretty hard for people to do. So I think the people that are doing well with it are seeing that they have an autonomy that they get from this. They, they start to feel more in control again, personal control. Um, and I think that's a great thing. It's, it's giving people hope that there's something very tangible that they can do. And, and that's a really great thing for people because that's the antithesis of depression. And we know that people with diabetes are twice as likely as the general population to experience depressive symptoms. So if this were to become the standard of care, what infrastructure would you need in place to implement it? Now, Ray's implementing it in the most difficult circumstances in Australia with some success. Um, but I'm assuming that's there's a fair bit of intense effort to make that happen. Only initially. Only initially. So it keeps rolling once you've started it because mm -hmm. people see the benefits. Because it's run by the nurse and the... GPs and so on. The, the biggest issue is the turnover of staff then, so in remote communities. So. Right. And are you doing it in communities without community-controlled health organisations? No, we have a partnership with community-controlled. Because that's a very different model from it's, standard general practice it's where it's team-based care, it is. paid differently. We're not working in silos. Sorry. That's okay. Um, so in the UK, the direct study that uh, um, Justine alluded to at the beginning, uh, did an analysis of with the health professionals that were involved in the study, and they found that it, the, the remission approach was highly appropriate in primary care when it was supported by dietitians. Now, I don't think that we have enough dietitians who understand diabetes who are able to support this in the healthcare system that we have at the moment. So I think that's a, a huge problem that we need to solve. I think we also need health coaches. Um, because the issues that Lorraine has been talking about are real for people, that they, 
they do need support with how to keep this on going in terms of staying motivated with it, in terms of uh, having that support to, to understand how they can keep going. So. So, so James, when you got onto this, how hard was it to find a dietitian who knew what he or she was talking about? It, it's, it's, it was tricky actually, uh, and uh, one or two reached out to me in the early years when I mentioned this in 2020, and uh, what I've been doing really since we were able to get remission into the National Diabetes Strategy in 2021, it wasn't until that point that I felt comfortable having the chat with the, with the patients. Uh, and of the first, so I've really just focused my conversation on my patients who have sight threatening diabetes related eye disease, not the, the uh, large no, cohort. No, no, I, I appreciate that, but you, you know, when you were on this journey, you looked for a dietitian who could help you out here. Yeah, yeah no, I'm getting, then, I'm getting to yeah. that. Yeah, so I, um, uh, once we started down that pathway, um, then I started to you, you use the nutritionist and also uh, Lorraine's dietitian. But because uh, there were only two that I was aware of in South Australia, that I didn't have that conversation with my greater pool of patients with type 2 diabetes. I was really just focusing on the ones with sight threatening eye disease, which I probably have about 150. So I mentioned, I wrote and communicated with the GPs that this is an incredible opportunity. We should, we should be exploring this. And so, yes, we need, there's absolutely no question, there's 7,000 dietitians or 8,000 dietitians around the country. Uh, we need to have them all on board with this. Uh, and we need also patients to have subsidised access to dietitians and nutritionists as well, because at the moment it's actually not covered by Medicare, it can be expensive, and that's a big barrier to them taking it up. How long had you had type 2 diabetes before you got onto the diet? Probably 10 years. Right. So my question to Gary and Steve is, how essential is early diagnosis to this story? Because obviously Bevan had well-established type 2 diabetes, well-established complications. Still got some benefit. What? How? How important is early diagnosis? So, um, uh, can I back up just on one? As far as yeah. what? Um, I, I just want to unpack some language that that people have used um, because James correctly said various forms of low carbohydrate diet, and and other people have used the term ketogenic. Um, and then the third thing that has been variably stated, but not overtly, is the issue of weight loss. So if you just think for a minute about a Maserati, um, it would be inappropriate to put ethanol blend in it because it's not going to go optimally. If they then came and said to you, we've now got a fantastic new fuel-efficient Maserati, it's more like a Prius, it uses very little fuel, you're still not going to put ethanol blend in it. So it's important that we take as a primary point that the degree of nutrition that we have is optimal. Now, if we were eating optimally, then you would see fewer and fewer people with early abnormalities of glucose tolerance. So that the earlier you intervene in the process, you can prevent it totally uh, if you intervene early, and then only small changes will be necessary. The further on you get in the disorder, the, the more radical. dramatic the changes you need. In the direct study, for example, the people who did best were using less medication, uh, had lower levels of blood sugar, had lower level of triglyceride, um, they weren't depressed or they had treated depression, and, and they did better. And, and there are easy reasons to understand that. In people who have bariatric surgery, the people who maintain their remission the longest are those who have diabetes for less than two years and so it goes. So there's a population health imperative that goes to equity and the way you make sure that everybody benefits is to ensure that everybody has access to the information about what healthy eating constitutes and that the environment is supportive. So we can spend lots and lots of money on dietitians or we can drum this into the head of young people in schools which is by far my preferred option. We teach them about the hazards of smoking, they learn about alcohol, and my kids harass me about driving constantly, but they'll go and buy donuts. So, you know, the schools are a good place to get information into the heads of children who will then disseminate that to their kids. And, and then the, sec the, the, the corollary of that is ensuring that there is some unanimity of the way information is disseminated by the media, 
in particular, and by healthcare professionals having a shared understanding. Conflicting information given to patients is confusing and frustrating, and then in the end they give up. So to well, you, can, you can blame them because I'm for, not blaming them. for yeah. years, yeah. Yeah. You know, nutritionists promoted the low-fat diet, right. which was disastrous. Right. Rather than, I mean, the Mediterranean diet is not a low-fat diet. And, and it's the Mediterranean style diet oh, that you're talking about. Totally. And, you know, the, the, um, the studies are very consistent about what constitutes an adequate dietary approach across multiple chronic diseases. And that's one of high nutritional sufficiency. There was also a recent study about the problem of processed foods um, being a significant factor underpinning the epidemic of diabetes. So if you just break this down into well, ultra processed foods, yeah. ultra processed foods, yeah. Just breaking this down into the most um, dichotomous uh, view, you would say ultra processed foods are on the one hand promoting diabetes. And if you eat um, whole foods, um, then you're going to improve diabetes and prevent diabetes. So that when you reduce carbohydrates at the most basic level is getting rid of ultra processed foods. And then you've got a variety of degrees of that. Whether you go to the extent of, of keto or you don't go to the extent of keto, and that's a choice for individuals, as long as the diet is overall sufficient in nutrients, and people have choice, then it's going to work fine because people will follow the diet that they feel comfortable with. But I think the principles are clear. Gary, great answer, but he didn't answer my question about early diagnosis and how if you're going to go, if you're going to intervene with, I, mean, oh, I, I, I think, I think the point about. So, so the, the reason I didn't answer your question directly is because early diagnosis and prevention are sort of part of a continuum. You can't screen everybody who's at risk, um, or, or we don't screen everyone who's at risk. Or well, we can. We've got a 45 year check. We're supposed, well, supposed to be able to do that. Right. So we, we did a study, T4DM. We enrolled men over the age of 45. Uh, we screened um, 10,000 men, um, and we found a huge number of people with diabetes that had never been, or pre diabetes, that had never been screened before. Now, there's some very simple tools that have been developed, like OzDiab risk score, which will, it's not perfect, but it will predict people at risk and then go and get a blood test. We're not really promoting screening as a community uh, to detect that, that iceberg of people at most risk. But I think, you know, there's such a high prevalence of, of, of obesity. There's such a high prevalence of inequity around healthcare, as you've highlighted, um, that Given all of that, we ought to be implementing this preventative strategy. A primary preventative strategy. Yeah, and then screening for those people at most risk and making it very clear who should be screened. Now, someone in the Department of Health can easily audit my stats and tell me that, you know, Gary, in 45-year-olds, you're not measuring their hemoglobin or you're not doing their blood sugars. They're paying me part of my wage. Um, they would have every right to do so. So I think we do have checks and balances that we could use, but I think, you know, we need to sit down and, and make a decision about how we're actually going to deal with something that's becoming a monumental problem. Steve, last night, on, which we were focusing on obesity, um, the endocrinologist on the panel, I mean, we had really a inter very interesting discussion about, you know, bariatric surgery, the new drugs to lose weight and so on, and where all this fits. And I believe you know, this is downstream from what we're talking about now. But nonetheless, the, the interesting point she made was that um, we tend to think that these new GLP-1s are fantastic. You prescribe them and walk away. And what she's saying, which is a similar point to what Gary's made, if, if you've got a crap diet and your BMI is 45, and I get you down to 30 or 29 through, you know, those MP or one of the new ones, if you're, if you're still on a crap diet, you may still die of a heart attack. And, and so are we, are we being misled about just the sole focus on weight loss here? Yes, I guess it's an obvious parameter which people uh, have an emotional attachment to, as I say, they, they like the scales uh, to be going in the right direction. But yes, you can lose weight but become less healthy. Um, 
And that's certainly so in, in the older age group of people I mean, who might get frail. Fascinating study overnight um, reported from the United States looking at one year's data of use of Ozempic from one of those pharmaceutical benefits management companies. And the health costs go up independent of the cost of the drug, because the drug was free in the people who took it, right. rather than people who didn't okay. and had a standard management. Well, I suspect that's about individual selection um, and being prepared to take into account the biological variability in how people respond to these therapies. And some people respond brilliantly with all the parameters, uh, glycemic control, weight, blood pressure, um, cardiovascular risk. Uh, but there's a you know, small number of people who don't lose any weight at all, even with maximum tolerated doses. Um, whether they ease up on their lifestyle measures because they think the, the drug is going to do it for them, whether they don't exercise enough to maintain their skeletal health, because that's important if you lose muscle. So how, how much work has been done on dietary quality, whether it goes to you know, low-carb diets or um, a Mediterranean-style diet in association with the rapid weight loss of either bariatric surgery or these medications? And, and the outcomes. Yeah, I don't think there's been anything really particularly systematic which has looked at di different dietary approaches. I mean, there's certainly the best data uh, is with the Mediterranean diet, but that's more at a population level and not specifically in people using GLP-1 agonists or bariatric surgery. Um, and then most of the studies on other dietary interventions are pretty short term you know, and they look at uh, weight, blood pressure, glycemic control. So we don't really know what a lot of the other dietary interventions do in terms of cardiovascular or, or mortality. So where do we stand with the guidelines? And are we integrating this evidence on low carbohydrate diets when you're at a certain point and integrating that into care as well as early on in the med I mean, it strikes me that in the past, the dietary guidelines have been a bit of a mess, including in type one, mm -hmm. with carbohydrate swaps and so on, low fat diet, that arguably the type one dietary process has been misguided too. Yeah, look, I mean, I think that's probably true in, in my opinion. Um, I you know, talk to virtually every diabetic patient, that, that person with diabetes that I see about their carbohydrate intake and you know, whether there are simple carbohydrates and processed foods that they can reduce. So I don't necessarily follow the, the formal dietary guidelines and, and my personal opinion is that they probably should be updated and reviewed. So in, uh, just in the beginning, you implied we were behind the rest of the world, are we? Yeah, well, probably. So where do we go from here in terms of just integrating this information, implementing it on a wide scale. I mean, let's start with general practice. I mean, I mean you're doing this out of the kind of, out of the goodness of your heart. You're not paid to do what you're doing. You're probably earning less money because of what you're doing because you're spending more time with each patient. You're not paid for team-based care. There is reform coming down the track. How do we get more GPs just paying attention to the problem, even if they're not doing what you're doing? I mean, how, give us... I think it really needs to start with a change in um, the guidelines for treating type 2 diabetes because the problem is is what I'm doing is... is You're off piste. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, for my problem is I see patients come to see me because they want to go use therapeutic carbohydrate reduction for their type 2 diabetes and when they go back to their GPs, often their GPs are pretty upset because obviously what I'm do doing does not fit with the guidelines. Um, so I, I think the guidelines need to be changed. Um, I think that's the first step. Um, and but let's, just, let's just imagine a guideline with this in it. So we've had Gary talking about primary prevention, which presumably would include exercise, weight control, and a highly nutritious diet that's low in red meat, high in vegetable. You know the story. I mean, what, what, tell me what it starts to look like from a GP's point of view that makes sense and not overly complicated, because as soon as it becomes overly complicated, GPs just don't have time to engage with it. So I've got a really simplistic view about diet. There's a certain amount of protein you need to eat every day. Um, and so we, we nail everybody's dietary protein. And just digressing a bit on that, you know, what this is one of the major problems we have 
um, with diet at the moment is a lot of people aren't hitting their protein targets. Particularly as they get older. At the, particularly as they got, get older. And because GLP-1 agonists tend to make you feel less hungry, then there is an association, a small association with loss of muscle mass with GLP-1 agonists because people don't hit their protein. Um, and, you know, protein, uh, low protein, you lose muscle mass. This is sarcopenia, which is a major problem for us from a public health perspective. Because you're on track to frailty. But it also aggravates insulin resistance. So your number one thing is you know your protein. Your number two thing is we limit your carbohydrates to whatever you need to to achieve your metabolic target. And your number three thing is we adjust fat. And fat is about does, how, do, how does the food taste? Is your, is your hunger being managed? And what are your weight loss goals? So if you want to lose weight, you need to drag your fat down. Um, if you're happy to maintain your weight, then you can have a little bit more fat. So it's pretty, my, my approach is pretty simple. And I find that works really well. And it's really simple with patients in terms of they don't really but have that, to count too much. But Jane would argue that's not going to get you as far as you need to get everybody with diabetes in your practice. Isn't what the, if that's your sole sort of, sort of, sort of focus. I mean, Jane, we're going to have a, a broader based approach, which is more behavioral, haven't we? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and my problem with this area of research at the moment is we've just seen the five-year findings from the direct trial come out in the UK, and they showed that only 8% of people were still in remission at five years. Less than 10% of people were still doing this or still able to be in remission at five years. But now, to be that's fair, that's not the only area of medicine where, I mean, you start somebody in a statin, 30% have stopped taking the statin at the end of the first year with all, you know, and there's no side effects. Yeah, effects, really. quite right. But what we're, the, the risk that we have here, and we've learned this from the um, work that's been done around the prevention studies for diabetes. So 20 years ago, um, the prevention studies were telling us that type 2 diabetes could be prevented, but only in 58% of cases. And yet all of the campaigns that came out from diabetes organisations, all the media headlines were all about diabetes is preventable. Not type 2 diabetes, not some type 2 diabetes, but all diabetes is preventable. That messaging is wrong and it's stigmatizing of people who are living with diabetes. Because you feel like diabetes. a failure if you've developed it. Because you're a failure if you haven't done it or you're lacking in willpower, which are own faults. You're to blame for it. And this is what the people living with diabetes are living with. Four out of five people living with diabetes are experiencing diabetes stigma and discrimination. That's a big problem. So, Bevan, you're a consumer, you're somebody with it. If you had the purse strings and the ability to you know, you know, do something here over the population of Australia, you've probably given us some thought. What would you suggest? Yeah, I certainly have. The, just one thing I want to bring up, though, I went to three medical practitioners before I went to James, and each one of them just gave me higher doses. There was never, ever any mention of losing weight. I was 110 kilos. I'm now 71. So I'm just letting you know that nobody even cared. You know, just give me some more juice and then talk about the cricket. I'm just, that's how it was. And oh, have, so when you said juice, you meant medicines. I thought you were it, talking about beer when you were medicine, watching medicine, Sorry, I medicine. I'm not, I'm, the juice. I'm not a medical practitioner, but I called it juice because it was in my arm or in my, in my stomach, wherever I put it. It was stuff that I didn't want. So to me, we, we've got to get through to the public that uh, this is how I look at it. If you had a purse string that was available, you'd get a good medium campaign going and say, we've got road accidents. We talk about them on TV and they're banging and you're ashamed. You might... You, you, tell your mum and dad that, you know, you killed somebody or whatever it says on, the, on that particular ad, why haven't we got one for diabetes? Which would tell people you can have a better life. We've got to pump up the idea that it's a better life. I've just had a better life. But wouldn't that be over-promising in, in the words that anything, James can anything, say about? Anything's better than what we're doing now. You've got to accompany that by the fact that if you're going to generate demand, the medical practitioners you go and see have a much more nuanced approach to people with diabetes. Well, I went to three that didn't never talk to me about food at all. Just told me I should have a bigger dose. Ray, how do you spread what you've, you know, what you're doing? I mean, that's what you think about every day of the week. How do you spread it? Yeah. It's so it's not relying on your efforts. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, oh, I don't run these programs, so these are run by the local health prof uh, professionals. So, you know, it, it's about uh, empowering the communities. It's about uh, locally designing 
something that's going to be successful. So what we might provide in Walgett or Canamble is going to be very different to what we'll provide in Jilkmingan. Jilkmingan in Northern Territory, you know, we're starting from scratch, you know, like uh, they're cooking outdoor on the fire all the time and they don't have refrigeration. So it, it's about working in with what is available right now? Uh, how do we make it working with uh, families? How do we make it, uh, des design it with accessible foods? How do you make it sustainable so that two years from now they're still doing it? And that's where the health, the primary care, it's got to be run through primary care. And you're talking about health coaches before. What we utilize is the local um, Aboriginal health workers and Aboriginal health practitioners, which are quite often you know, local people who are just not leaving the area. They're, they're born and bred there. They love the community. They're related to the community and they're invested in the community and that they make the best health coaches. Okay. Um, so I'm talking about implementation, getting it on the ground. Yeah, what are the key absolutely. things that need to happen? Uh, there's, there's multiple layers of, of, the, of things that need to happen. Uh, the dietary guidelines we've talked about. Um, guidelines for therapeutic carbohydrate reduction, ketogenic or low carbohydrate diets. Uh, Steve and Loreen have been working on this for the last year and about to be released. Once we have uh, a guideline in place, we can then embed it into medical school training. We can embed it into postgraduate CPD training for GPs. We can also get it into training in dietitians and nutritionist circles. My, my son, who was in second year medical school three years ago, he had the opportunity to do nutrition as an elective. So if we realize that the biggest driver of our poor health is diet, and yet um, should poor, be an poor elective. diet, it, should be part of the course. it absolutely should be a part of the course, and it should be compulsory, and it should be compulsory in every single medical school. Um, so there's, there's a long way to go, but once we have the guidelines in place, specifically for people with type 2 diabetes remission, um, then I think we're going to um, launch into a whole new world. Aaron? Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with that. I think we need much better education. Um, I gave a lecture to the students in fourth year, um, and, you know, I was taught this very simple approach to nutrition, which is called dietary monotheism, one God, one diet. Um, and that's a healthy food diet which reduces chronic disease, prevents, and treats. And I think the, the simple message to people, I deal with a lot of men's health. Men take up binary messages very well. So I teach them about mothers and growing. So when you put food on your plate, if it hasn't been growing before it was on your plate, don't eat it. And if it wasn't with its mother, don't eat it. So it gets the message very well across about um, unprocessed foods. So I think, you know, that those simple messaging to the public with better training of healthcare professionals and more appropriate guidelines uh, would go a very long way to solving this problem. But you know, nowadays, this is a partnership with patients. And unless we're able to get information out to the public um, so that they share that information uh, and, and even can come and ask for, for better care, I think would be a much better way to proceed with this than what we're doing now. And you know, just, I'm going to come to Steve with the last word, but you know the, the reforms in general practice, if they happen, they will make they should make some difference to this. Steve, you got the last word. Um, yeah, look, just one point. I mean, this is not all about remission, and remission is probably great. But if you can improve somebody's glycemic control, um, but still not, and they still are going to remission, that's still a potential big win for that individual person. And sort of Bevan's experience. Um, you know, if, if he, even if he hadn't got off insulin and even if he hadn't got into remission, if he had better control of his diabetes and his general health through better nutrition, that would still be a win. And you probably more, achieve more by dropping somebody's HbA1c from 10 to 8 than you do in dropping them from 6.7 to 6.3. So that person going from 6.7 to 6.3 has gone into remission. But in terms of the magnitude, the magnitude, of the magnitude of important outcomes. You're probably actually doing more for that person who might not be able to go into remission. So you, you do have to be realistic about what that, that person is trying to achieve. They might not be realistically trying to get into remission, but if they're they're trying to at least improve their glycemic control, their weight, and their general health, and that's that's just as important an outcome as achieving a remission. 
a lot of work to be done. Can I make one point? I think the elephant in the room here is, is food addiction. And if we look at um, the long-term results of, of these studies, uh, looking at remission, and the, and the VERTA study is now out to five years with 50% still in remission, it then begs a question, what about that other 50%? What's happening with that other 50%? Uh, I suspect a significant issue is, is support and support within the family and also the health practitioners. But I think the other thing is addiction. And if we realise that food addiction is strongly associated with type 2 diabetes, and we have multiple industries, sugary drinks industry, ultra-processed food industry, fast food industry, who have addictive products, and they're actually preying on the addictions of vulnerable people. And I think that absolutely needs to be addressed because, you know, if I'm, I know if I have ice cream in the fridge, it's, it's singing out to me. Uh, and so for people who are trying to stay in remission, they go to the service station, they go to the supermarket, even the chemist these days, and there's half price chocolates and soft drinks, it makes it very, very difficult. And this absolutely needs to be addressed as well. So regulation, differential taxation, that sort of thing. Could you please join me? Thank you. Our fantastic panel. Thanks, Norman. Um, yes, thank you to our panel. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, James. Thank well, you, you Gary, Ray. Steve. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, James, Steve, and Laureen. What I hear in summary is there are so many opportunities, opportunities to make both small, incremental, individual changes that may just impact one person in a small way, but there are also opportunities for large scale step change. We have the brain power in Australia. We have the experts. If we all work together and consider ways to, to do things slightly differently, I think there is great hope. I want to say that nobody chooses diabetes, nobody. We have to keep fighting against stigma. We have to keep fighting against discrimination. What gives me hope at the end nearly of this national diabetes work is the commonality of themes that I'm hearing coming out. And we really wanted to spark Australia's largest conversation about the impact of diabetes in Australia and really support and feed information that we gather from all of these um, discussions into the parliamentary inquiry into diabetes that is currently happening. Some of the themes that I'm hearing are more support is needed at an individual level, a community level, at a workforce level, that gui dietary guidelines and clinical guidelines have an opportunity for review that the value of CGM and tech is increasing and biofeedback mechanisms are incredibly important. That while we have workforce challenges, we also have workforce opportunities, and that's really encouraging. We have an Albanese government who is um, actively working on Medicare reform, and we should all continue to advocate strongly for the opportunities that come with that. That early education is absolutely critical. We need to educate not just for this generation, but for future generations, for the kids that are still to come, for our grandkids and their grandkids, for our nieces and nephews and their kids. There is so much opportunity. And we need to remember that there is never going to be a one size fits all solution. So let's continue to be expansive in our thinking, kind in our conversations, and support an Australia where we get to a point where diabetes can do no harm. Thank you.